Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live chat today with YA author Rachel Carter. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. She's tuning in from the woods in Vermont <laughs> for a little getaway. Um, before we start our questions and answers, I wanted to tell everyone who's uh, viewing right now a little bit about Rachel. Um, she grew up in Vermont and recently graduated from Columbia University with an MFA in nonfiction writing. Um, Rachel is an avid reader and a lover of all things pop culture. Uh, she's the author of the So Close to You series, and Harper Teen has just released the latest book from that collection, Find Me Where the Water Ends. So, uh, Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about your book without giving uh, too much away for those who haven't gotten their hands on it yet? Yeah, sure. Um, so, this is the last book in this series, so this is the final chapter. Um, and the books are time travel, government conspiracy theory, and I would say romance. So they're like romantic light sci-fi. That's an awesome combination. Mm -hmm. um, so you say the books are based on real conspiracy theory. So um, is that like government and you know corruption and just kind of scandal? And, and what kind of research goes into that? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the books are based on a conspiracy theory in Montauk, New York, called the Montauk Project. Montauk's on the very tip of Long Island, and um, there's an old army base out there called Camp Hero that uh, in the 40s was an army base, and they had all these weapons just in case Germany attacked, um, and they had like a whole army camp set up to look like a village, so it was hidden in case the enemy showed up. Um, and then it got, it became abandoned in around the 80s or so, and then very recently they turned it into a state park. So this conspiracy sort of built up around this camp, especially during mm -hmm. the times when it was, when it was abandoned. And the idea was that Nikola Tesla faked his own death in the 40s oh. or, the, or the 30s, and then lived through the 40s. And then, um, he, uh, he went underground in Montauk and created a time machine. Um, for the yeah. government. So the idea was that the government was running this secret paranormal uh, weaponry um, sort of thing out of out of this out of the secret base that nobody knew about um, called Project Rainbow um, or a part of Project oh, Rainbow. Wow. Yeah. And so um, so Nikola Tesla faked his death, came up with a time machine and then the conspiracy went crazy from there. So there's all these <laughs> these theories that um, that they were able to use the time machine to tap into wormholes that connected uh, us to these alien races called reptoids and that the reptoids would come to Montauk and there were all these like uh, sightings that women had like on the beach or that they were getting attacked by reptoids and so there's a lot there's a lot of different layers to this conspiracy but yeah it's a, it's a real thing and so there's a lot of people who go out there to Montauk to, to search to find out if it's if there's really a base under the ground. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shayla, actually, she had a question about um, where the water ends. She wanted to know, uh, what's your favorite quality about your main character in this book? That's a really good question. Um, so Lydia is the protagonist through all three books. Um, she is very tenacious. And I think that's actually my favorite quality about her, in part because I think it gets her into trouble. So in the first book, she um, she kind of stumbles into this conspiracy. Her family is wrapped up in it in certain ways, and she ends up getting sent back to World War II era and has to um, figure out how her family fits in with this. And she decides when she's in the past that she wants to change the future. And so she's extremely tenacious about this, even though she's being warned by all these outside forces that it's a bad idea. Um, she pushes and pushes and pushes and, and basically does it anyway. Um, and then the next two books are sort of dealing with the consequences of, of that decision. But I really liked just like, I like that quality in her because I think it's one that she never loses, but it's one that changes yeah. as she matures. Excellent. Unwavering tenacity. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jessica has another question about um, Find Me Where the Water Ends. She says, um, it's part of a trilogy, and would you recommend that people read the first two before delving into this third um, book? I would say yes, definitely. <laughs> um, okay. there, I kind of think that nowadays trilogies, especially in YA, sort of um, 
for telling one exactly. big story. Um, mm -hmm. And my books are definitely doing that. So there's a cliffhanger on the end of the first two books. Uh, and Find Me Where the Water Ends is really the book that ties it all together. And I suppose you could read it as a standalone. I think it would make sense. But I think that if you're yeah. really going to see the journey that the characters go through, reading all three exactly. is probably the way to go. I, yeah, how could you just read just one? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you want to read the whole thing. Um, Gigi has a question about um, time travel. <laughs> if you could go back in time or travel to the future, uh, which would you choose and what would you do while you were there? I get asked this question a lot, and I think it's because I like, obviously the time travel thing. Um, and I mm -hmm. wish I had come up with a better answer, answer by this point because I, I think, I think honestly I would want to go into the future. I'm the type of person mm -hmm. who I like to know everything. Like I'll I'll look up all the spoilers for a TV show, and sometimes I like read the last yeah. page of a book before I finish it. So like I like to know how things are going to end. Um, so I think going into the future would be good, but the past, if I was going to go into the past, there would be specific dates I would go to, but certain things I have no interest in. Like I have no interest yeah. in getting the plague and I have no interest in getting chased around by dinosaurs <laughs> or like burned at the stake because I'm educated. No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I agree. <laughs> um, Actually, speaking of wanting to fast forward to TV shows and the endings of them, we have a question about guilty pleasures. Um, this is from Kenna. She wants to know, what, have, what are some of your guilty pleasure TV shows? Okay, anybody who knows me knows that this, I could talk for like 45 minutes about this because I am like the guilty pleasure uh, queen. Um, so, <laughs> I, I mean, I watch everything. And I would say that right now my biggest, my biggest obsession is probably Korean soap operas. Um, wow. K-drama. Awesome. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's huge. It's a huge thing in the YA community. I've made so many friends uh -huh. because I like K-drama. Um, so, yeah, that's probably my biggest guilty pleasure of the moment. Excellent. Um, so I have a question about YA in general from Liz. Um, so on a recent episode of the Colbert Report, Stephen Colbert said this about YA novels. He said, as far as I can tell, a YA novel is a regular novel that people actually read. Um, do you agree with his statement? Uh, <laughs> I actually saw that. I think he was interviewing John Green. Um, yes, he was. Yeah. I, you know, yes and no. I think that <laughs> YA is really booming right now. Um, mm -hmm. I hope for the sake of my career and the careers of my friends that it stays booming, um, but I think that we've seen a lot of genres have their boom and then fade a little bit. Like I know horror was huge yeah. in the eighties. Now it's so hard to sell a horror novel. Um, uh, you know, memoir had its huge heyday in the late nineties, early two thousands, and now it's getting less popular. So I think that YA is probably in the same sort of cycle that everything's in. Um, at the same time, it really does seem to be fulfilling this, this. Um, niche that we didn't that that maybe needed to be filled that people are really yeah. looking for and seeking um so will it stay as commercially popular i don't know but um i do think that it it's clearly something that people really love and really respond to absolutely i agree um brenda has a question about characters she says how much of you goes into your characters? Um, are any of them inspired by you or people around you? Um, yeah, a lot of them are. Um, <laughs> how much of me goes in? It's hard to tell. It's like when you first start writing them, I think a lot more of you goes in. But by the end, by the end and so now I've been with Lydia for three books, and at this point I, I don't think we're anything alike. But I think certainly beginning I was pulling – parts of myself, especially because the book is first person. And I think when you write Ooh. in the eye, even if it is fictional, sometimes you get woven in there. Um, but for secondary characters, uh, the character of Mary, who's a, a favorite and one of my favorites, um, she's uh, named after my middle sister, my second, one of my sisters. And then, uh, but she's based on another one of my sisters. So I used my sister as like a template to create her. And then uh, Grant, <laughs> 
who's not in there much, but he's definitely this guy I went to high school with, like, to a T. <laughs> so I think That's sometimes you pull, you definitely pull from the people around you. It's, I think the more interesting thing is how much other people think that they're in it when they're not. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of, like, my relatives like, I was not talking about you. <laughs> yeah, and, like, family and friends will come and be like, oh, I totally know that that person was that person, or I think I'm that person, and I'm like, yeah, sure, you're that person. <laughs> awesome um shayla wants to know what the response has been to your series um she says do people come up to you at book events or online and do they tell you what they think um yeah i mean the response has been great um you know i, I think it's always sort of shocking as a writer to yeah. when you realize that anybody other than your mother is reading your books <laughs> um so you know is it like uh, the hunger games level and I you know I've been to you know conferences with like I, I was at Romantic Times when Veronica Roth was there and uh, and people were selling tickets oh, wow. to get to see her you know so I'm not certainly not there but I definitely have like some really loyal friends and um, and they've been amazing through the whole thing and have helped me and you know helped put on blog events for me and um, and come to events to meet me and talk to me online and I've made so many friends the series which is not something that I was anticipating um and every once in a while I still will get an email from you know somebody in Singapore you know who's like wow. is the book coming to Singapore and, and that always kind of blows me away the thought that you know somebody so far away has even like heard of it it's like it's very flattering yeah that's amazing um I was talking to someone the other day about just the differences in book titles in different countries. Have you seen any others, and are they extremely different? Is it like the same? Like what it? What's the general um, cover like? I I mean I've seen so close to you has only sold in the U.S. and in Brazil, um, and so we're we're still waiting to see what the the Brazil oh. covers will look like, and I'm definitely curious. And I think it's going to be very interesting to have a book in which I can't understand anything that I wrote. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, I think that's going to be weird. Um, You'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But certainly a lot of my friends and, and the, the authors that I love, their books are published throughout. And one of my favorite things to do, actually, is mm -hmm. go and see what their books look like in other countries. Uh, right. it's, it's always fascinating. Yeah, it's fun. Um, speaking of just interacting with fans, uh, Brenda has a Twitter question. Uh, she said, how much time do you spend on Twitter and do you get any of your ideas um, from people you interact with on social media? Um, I, you know, I'm, I would call my Twitter use moderate. Like, I, I'm on it probably once a few times a day, but I'm not, like, mm -hmm. obsessed. Um, I try to sometimes just turn it all off. Uh, but I, you know, I definitely have made more friends through Twitter than anything else. So Twitter has been one of the best ways to meet and connect with other writers, to meet and connect with readers, um, bloggers, librarians, and, and it's been great so that when I am going to these conferences, I can hang out with people that I feel like I already know. Um, so Twitter has been awesome in that way. Uh, as for getting ideas from them, I mean, yeah, so, you know, you, you start creating friendships, people start being your crit partners, um, or, yeah. you know, or even other weird things. So I mentioned the K-drama, the Korean soap operas, and um, mm -hmm. and me and a whole group of, of other uh, bloggers and YA writers uh, got together and started doing this blog promotion thing called um, YA Meets K-drama, where we would cast YA novels as Korean soap operas. So we find like our favorite Korean stars and cast them in it uh, and create fake cub like, you know, storylines and all that stuff. And that was a lot of fun. So yeah, I met a lot of friends and Twitter's great for that. Yeah, it's a great way to just reach out to people. Um, now what about your blog? Jessica says that you're pretty active on your blog and uh, she says, how do you keep the ideas fresh in your mind and how consistently do you post? I mean, God bless Jessica for saying that because I do not think I'm that active. Maybe she just does it like once a year. <laughs> yes. I am like That's so funny. bad at blogging. I mean, I love blogging to an extent, but I don't. I don't love anything that starts to feel like work. Um, if it's not something I really want to be doing, and I like blogging a lot, but I, I really am on there maybe once a month 
or so. Um, so that's and as, yeah, <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> so what do I post? I, you know, I post a lot of stuff about my series. It's a really great place to just be like, here's a roundup of everything okay. that's happening, and you know, and links and this and that. And then, um, and then it's also a great place to um, connect. So much of the way world now is just online and in blogs and. Um, so I've been able to be a part of some cool blog events. Like I usually always do the YA scavenger hunt, uh, which happens oh, cool. twice a year. It's amazing. Um, Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's this event where, um, you know, there's usually like 50 writers involved, YA authors involved, and we're split into teams. And so uh, on oh. the day of the few days of the hunt, you have to go from, from author to author to author, gathering these sort of secret numbers, and each author is like hosting another author with their ex with like exclusive content. So you get like all this exposure to different YA authors. You end up hitting all these different blogs, and at the end, a reader will win all of the books. Um, oh, excellent! Which is amazing. So readers are winning like twenty five books each. Um, wow. Yeah, and then each author will do their own giveaways. So it's like a lot of giveaways, a lot of ways to meet people. And so I try to be involved in certain blog events like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Shayla has a question about reading your own reviews. She says, do you read your reviews? And if so, how do you deal with negative reviews? Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I yeah. think that most people will say that they don't um, because it's like it's horrifying um, what I will usually do so when when so close to you came out I read a lot of them and um, to the point where I could almost say I got addicted to good reading, <laughs> like just checking and <laughs> seeing what everybody was saying um, and I think that it is a good idea to get the climate of reviews especially in the first few weeks of just just the climate of how readers are taking mm -hmm. the books and what are their serious criticisms and what aren't. Um, but then after that, I think it's a good idea to sort of to tune it out and to not try to read every single one. It will, it will make you crazy. And some of it is very smart, great negative criticism, and some of it is like, mm -hmm. you suck. And so... Yeah, <laughs> just nobody wants to it. at all, right? Yeah, or yeah. at least it's not even helpful and demoralizing. Yeah. Um, so on the flip side of that, Helen says, what's the best piece of writing advice you ever received on the So Close to Me series? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say, I don't know that, well, yeah, I guess it's specific advice. So I have the, an amazing editor at Harper Teen. I worked with Sarah Doss Barley, and she's the best. Um, and she, uh, she... I think it was, I, so I, I wrote the book straight out of my MFA program, mm -hmm. so I wasn't, um, I wasn't unfamiliar with criticism, but I had never had that kind of close editorial attention. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I had, but I hadn't. And so then once I yeah. had it, it changed everything. And so Sarah did a great job and just, I think at one point she just said, like, this is something that you do as a writer. This is one of your habits. And the habit was that I would, um, when I was describing a scene, I would um, spend like a whole chunk just describing what the room looked like. And then I would just have chunks of dialogue. So none of it was woven together. I had no idea I was doing that. So it, it was having oh, wow. her as like a close editor really come in and say, this is a habit that you have that isn't good. And just, you know, in a way being really blunt about it, it changed my writing forever. That's amazing. Yeah. And you'd never be able to tell if, like, someone didn't step back and say, hey, it's, like, a new pair of eyes is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and sometimes it's tough to hear criticism, you know, and these editorial letters you get are 15 pages long and single-spaced, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, telling you what <laughs> And it's not always like, easy, thanks. but it's, yeah, it's <laughs> always necessary. <laughs> wow. Um, so what are you currently reading? Um, Lydia has a question. She says, are you able to write your books and read someone else's work simultaneously, or do you have to kind of take a break while you're writing? That is such a good question, because I did not realize how much, um, how much reading, how much writing would affect my reading. Uh, I'm a huge reader. I always have been devouring, 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 and I have to say I've read less 
in the past year than I ever had while I've been writing the books. Um, and a part of it is that I have a very difficult time writing reading YA while I'm in the middle of writing very intensively. And I'm saying that in that I would have periods where I would be writing a lot. So I'd have periods of revision or periods where I was under deadline. And during that time, I could not read YA um, because I felt too, like, too influenced um, by somebody else's work. Um, and I, it just wasn't working. So during that time, I read a lot of cheesy romance novels. Uh, which yeah, I was going to ask you, what else did you read? <laughs> I read that a lot of sense. romance. Because that was great, because I always, re I'm an escapist reader, it's why I like, I have mm -hmm. all those guilty TV shows, and so I need to, right. like, have, be taken away, swept away. Um, yeah. And romance will certainly do that. I also found that reading, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I've always felt is reading, writing that I really admire, helped me a lot, too. So I was reading a lot of um, Marquez and a lot of Andanche, and, mm -hmm. um, Writers who I aspire to write like always helps me while I'm writing. Uh, Did you say Michael on Donjay? Yeah. He's my favorite author, I think, of all time. Yeah. <laughs> the I collected just, works of Billy the Kid. Yeah, I love that yeah. prose book. He's, he's so, so yeah. <laughs> Running the Family is one of my favorite. Like, he's just so, mm -hmm. um, the lyrical quality, like, that's what I, I want my writing to be. So reading stuff like that helps a lot, yeah. too. Poetry helps a lot. Um, mm -hmm. but so now that, now, right now I'm working on a new book, so I haven't been reading that much YA, uh, but I've actually started rereading all the Outlander books. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah, which I, I actually write for Book Trip a little too, and I wrote a thing yeah, about I was Outlander. just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's done some awesome articles. She's done Secrets of Time Travel, things about fiery dragons. She's done fashion pieces. Uh, she's done cheat, uh, cheat sheets for upcoming films. An Outlander. Tell us a little bit about that. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm really excited to be reading rereading all the Outlanders. Although it's a like a total uh, commitment because they're all like a thousand pages. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a little daunting at first. <laughs> yeah, it's a little much. <laughs> so like, oh, Gigi, this is interesting. This question from Gigi. Um, she says, "What is your favorite mythical creature?" <laughs> Oh gosh! You can have some <laughs> fantasy stuff, yeah. I don't even know if I could answer that. What counts as a mythical creature? Like, is it just like like high fantasy creatures? I guess, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I would probably <laughs> say, you know, I'd probably say mermaid. Mm hmm. I always wanted to be one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah me and too. I like <laughs> I love the water. I just. Mm -hmm. I love being in water, and yeah, I would definitely say mermaid. Um, find me where the water ends. <laughs> there you go. Um, Lydia asked, uh, what are some of your favorite books, speaking of reading? Um, so if I, my favorite books tend to be really long, complicated uh, romantic series. Often about communist okay. Russia, <laughs> not exclusively, <laughs> but sometimes. So probably my favorite books are um, the Bronze Horseman series by Paulina Simon Simmons or Simons. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. So I yeah I like I, I tend to like really, yeah oh god if you like Outlander like everybody should be reading these books. Um, yeah, it's like it's set in World War Two and it's this young girl, Russian girl, they're in Leningrad uh, during the siege, and so it sort of starts out with her on the first day of war breaking out, and she's kind of like this flighty girl who's like falling in love with her sister's boyfriend, um, and then the siege happens and like everybody starts like starving to death, so that it's like very these oh, stark wow. sort of, it doesn't sound romantic, but it's really, really super romantic. Um, so I love those books. I, I love so many books. Um, YA, I I, uh, I've been reading a lot of um, Ava Ebitson, who I really like mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, she has kind of like that more old-fashioned style. Um, yeah, I, I love it a lot. I love the Cassandra Clare books. The new one just came out. Um, I'm super excited that the new uh, uh, Lola book, what is that? I'm going to, Stephanie Perkins book, Lola and uh, the the happily ever after, I think. 
it called? No, not Lola. Um, oh gosh, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed with everything you remembered so far. So <laughs> yeah, I've been really good. Uh, no, it's, it's the new Stephanie Perkins book. It's uh, it's coming out this summer, and I'm super super excited about that one. So I read a lot of contemporary oh. YA's, um, mm -hmm. but I also read a lot of um, fantasy. I just I really am all over the place. Cool. Um, Rachel wants to know about your characters. Um, she says, your characters are so well-rounded. What's the process of um, developing one of your characters in your books? Um, do you diagram, keep a, bi a binder full of notes? You kind of just go with the flow? Um, I think I went more with the flow on So Close to You, and there's a part of me that wishes I hadn't. Um, I found this amazing exercise that I've been doing for... Uh, I'm work on the new books that I'm working on, I did this exercise. It's the best thing I've ever done, which is you, uh, for an entire page, describe your character's face. And all you can oh, describe wow. is their face. And it, it, had forced, it forced me to know those characters in this way that just was so deep, so quick. Um, but even with So Close to You, I did a lot of, uh, of character sheets, um, especially mm -hmm. with, with Wes, who's the love interest. Wes is very um, hard. He's very like, he's one of those mysterious bad boy types, but he's more complicated than that. And he was hard sometimes for me to really feel like I know. And so doing, I did a lot of prep work on him. So I think maybe like my long winded answer here is that I do a lot of prep work on my characters. I'll do a lot of character sheets. I do a lot of writing character, like paragraphs about just what they look like, who they are, what they do. Um, I write out graphs of their trajectory through the novel and then how their trajectory meets with other trajectories. So like each character goes through their own sort of like process of growing and so how each one interacts with each other. So yeah, I do, I just, I'm not a good, um, I'm not a pantser at all. I'm a plotter. Yeah, someone had a question about that actually. <laughs> really? if, you were, if you were a plotter or a pantser. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a pantser. No way. So those of you who don't know, pantser means do you fly by the seat of your pants, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and no, I can't. I have lots of graphs. Every time I try, it's just a big mess and I have to start over. Yep, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. um, Helen wants to know about just the setting when you're writing. Um, she says, are you able to write in any setting or do you have a time and place that you feel most productive when you're writing? Um, I would say that I can write in any setting. It's not my ideal. When I'm under deadline, yeah. I sometimes don't have a lot of choice. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was writing these books, I was mostly living in Brooklyn in New York City. And I was working a lot. So I had three jobs on top of writing the books. And I would leave oh, my wow. house at 7 in the morning. And I would come home at 7 and I would go right to the Starbucks across my street and, and write for four hours. Um, wow. And so it was, yeah, it was really crazy. And then uh, and I, I moved to Vermont and that's been so much better. <laughs> so now I get to write in, like, adorable uh, libraries and, like, little <laughs> cabins in the woods wow. where there's, like, nobody for, like, 100 miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, picturesque. <laughs> yeah, so I prefer that. But I'm also definitely a night writer. I'm not a day writer. Yeah. Makes sense. That's a long day, and coming home to write, that's dedication. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mac wants to know, um, what book-to-movie adaptation would you say is your all-time favorite? <laughs> that's a tough question. But actually, I have, like, I'm, like, ready. Uh, the Princess Bride. Ah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I love the book. I love the movie. Everything's right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, oh, Rachel has an interesting question. Um, she says, what drew you to the year 1944? She said that time period is so fascinating. Um, and she said she's glad you incorporated your book during that time. Um, just go off of the main theme or? Yeah, I mean, the 40s made the most sense because um, the idea was that I, I wanted to write about it right when the Montauk Project was getting created. And so the yeah. the war around the project is that it, it was like, is the facility was built in 1943. Um, so 1944, it was like, it was getting towards the end of the war. Um, 
and it sort of it, it kind of it made sense like I wanted it to be like a year after the, the project had been built so it was like kind of there but not totally perfect yet um and they could they could but it was still part of World War II and had that kind of vibe I really wanted to create that atmosphere during the book I did a lot of research on what Montauk looked like on what teens really were like during the yeah. era um my grandmother was the most helpful because she uh she, she was able to give me really first-hand accounts of what teenagers were like um yeah because I did I read so much research but you know you like if you think about our time and you read about our mm -hmm. time like 70 80 years from now you're they're gonna you will look at like the top charts and it'll be like Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus but I don't know any teenagers who are really listening to that stuff or that it's not cool to listen to that stuff. So I wanted the book to really feel like um, like the, the real time period. So she gave me some helpful tips. Like everybody hated Frank Sinatra at the time. Um, oh. He was like very uncool. He was like the Justin Bieber during the 40s. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Um. Kenna wants to know, have you ever thought about writing in another genre? And if so, uh, what would it be? I have. I'm actually working on a high fantasy series right now, um, which sometimes gets lumped together. I know high fantasy and sci-fi, or fantasy and sci-fi get lumped together mm -hmm. in the Barnes and Noble and stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't, yeah, so I, I guess that's a different genre. I am actually really love... Um, writing and reading contemporary uh, realistic fiction YA, um, so more in the style mm -hmm. of John Green and um, Sarah yeah. Zarr. And, yeah, so I'm working mm -hmm. on a, a novel like that too. Yeah, but I, I think I would stay with YA for now. Yeah. I really, really love writing about coming of age stories. Cool. Oh, Michelle has a, a cool question. She says, maybe this has to do with like the graphs that you make. She says, how do you keep up with character details consistent in the three books? Do you keep a series Bible? I don't, but I should have because mm -hmm. I just wrote on Twitter the other day that I had to Google something about my own book. Because um, <laughs> I forgot, like I've completely, it was so long ago since I wrote So Close to You and I wrote so many drafts of So Close to You uh, mm -hmm. that sometimes I forget what what draft ended up or like what thing ended up in which part of the draft. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a little bit tough. Um, so I don't remember everything always. <laughs> like keeping with the char like who the characters are at their core, I I know really really well, and so I never lose that. But sometimes I I think I forgot for a long time. Like I was writing book three, and I couldn't remember how old Lydia was. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I, when I wrote like book three, I had book two and one open so mm -hmm. I could go through each to try to like remember all the little details. That's crazy. It's like studying, right? It's a lot. <laughs> and it, it seems like stupid because I came up with it. Like I thought it all up. Um, but, but it was a lot. It was a long time ago, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Andrew wants to know, what do you think about, what do you think that the future holds for YA novels? Um, do you see them becoming the it books of the future? Or they kind of are right now, I think. Yeah, I think they are now. I mean, I think I talked about it a little bit earlier, like, um, I, YA is booming, and I hope that that boom stays. Um, but I know that other genres have boomed, and, and that hasn't stayed. Um, I do think that in certain ways, why is different. I know that mm -hmm. um, that it's the sort of genre that that speaks to a lot of different types of people um, and speaks to teens and adults, um, and you know, and, and everybody in between. So it's I know there's it's it's like it's got a lot of fans. Um, so I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see. I hope. It stays <laughs> the way it is. Uh, I like reading it. I love reading it. And um, I know when I was a teen, there was nothing like what there is yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember it was either like you were reading Judy Bloom, or there were all these like series books. I don't know if you I remember know. these. Like, um, do you remember that like Fear series? And it, I remember reading this series about this girl who like couldn't feel fear. 
Um, but there would be these like 20,000 word books and there would be like a hundred of them. And you would That's just crazy. like every time I went, to, and it was the same with like the Sweet Valley High books. Like, yeah, I was just, just gonna like, say Sweet Valley High was just, it was insane. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I remember it was when I was a teenager, it was like, so you know, like, hi, goes to college, and Nancy Drew goes to college. Like, those were, like, the big ones. And they were always, like, sleeping with their professors and stuff. It was always very <laughs> racist. Um, <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so when I was a teen, those were huge. So it was either, like, you could get, like, this 20,000-word, like, love story, or you could read, like, these exactly. sort of the books you were reading in school, and there was no middle. No. Yeah, it was all love. Yeah. Um, Karen has a cool question. She says, what person would you like to write about in a nonfiction book if you were to work on that next? Oh, gosh. <laughs> These are so far. I have no idea. Okay, um, let me think. so many. Yeah. <laughs> I, seriously, you know, it's, it's going to sound super um, narcissistic, but I would probably say if I was to write a nonfiction book, I would write on them. Um, oh. I, yeah, I went to school, I actually got my MFA in nonfiction writing, and my thesis mm -hmm. was a collection of essays about growing up in Vermont, oh, um, neat. being a teenager in Vermont, and so, and all those essays were already coming of age stories, which made it kind of a natural transition for me into writing YA, but um, I think if I was ever to do a nonfiction book, I would, I would either finish that essay collection or I would write a memoir about my teen years. Oh, neat. Um, yeah, w were you living like in a really rural area? Was it just kind of a different, different scene yeah. from Brooklyn, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, so different. It's, it's weird. It's like, I don't know that it's a lifestyle that it exists that is that common and I didn't realize how uncommon it was until I left um yeah. but I grew up in the woods in mm -hmm. um in a log cabin that my dad built um and we had this very typical Vermont life so we had a lot of animals and we lived on a dirt road and we uh have a sugar house so we sugar every that means to make maple syrup um mm -hmm. every which cool. I didn't realize that not everybody knows that sugaring can also be a verb and um <laughs> Yeah, so we make maple syrup, and um, and a lot of my friends grew up that way, too. Um, and there's a lot of things that I really loved about growing up in small-town Vermont. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's a place that's very isolated, that's very right. um, non-diverse, that's very... Um, um, there's not much for teenagers to do, so I think people mm -hmm. were getting into a lot of trouble in ways that maybe right. they weren't in other places. Mm -hmm. um so I think that all that converging could be a really interesting story yeah that sounds fantastic a little peek into your teen years <laughs> <laughs> um unfortunately we've come to the end of the questions I wish we could keep going but um it was a pleasure chatting with you today and learning all about your fantastic new series and congratulations yeah, on so release day yeah Thanks. absolutely I know it's like one <laughs> week from today it feels very surreal did... like when the first when the first book came out, I was like, I had like a party. I was so excited. But by yes. book three, I was kind of like, Whoa. I was going to ask you how you how you celebrated, but it's kind of uh, yeah. <laughs> I now. went to the I went to the beach. That's like, nice. I, I didn't like I didn't have a party. I you know I didn't do much in that way. But it was nice. I mean, it's amazing. It feels great, yeah. and it's been so nice to sort of um, get feedback from the readers and to hear what everybody thinks about um, how if the series came together as three um, rather than as just one or two. So it's been amazing. Awesome. Um, so we just wanted to remind everyone to stop by booktrip.com after the live chat and enter to win copies of Rachel's uh, latest release, Find Me Where the Water Ends, and check out her articles on Book Trip. They're great. And it was lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Yeah.